Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week we're gonna take a look at my top tech products of 2021. And there's a bunch of them that stood out this year. So let's get to it. So let's take a look at my ground rules as to how products get selected for this video. The big one is that I need to have some direct experience with it, usually in the form of a review that I shot here on the channel. And that review needs to have been done since the last time I did a top products of the year video. So our look back here is to about November 30th of 2020. Now, some of these products might not be new, but they were new to me in the sense that I reviewed them over the last year. And because these are things that I have direct experience with, you might have direct experience with something better than what I'm about to present here. And I would love to get your feedback in the comment stream because that might inform future videos. So with that out of the way, let's get to the list. So let's start off with our first category here, the gaming category. And at the top of the list this year is an easy choice, the Xbox Series X. I purchased this last year around December or so. We did an unboxing video and a first impressions video. And this is a really big improvement over the prior generation console. So much so that I've been using this console a lot more than I did with the prior iterations of the Xbox One. And one of the things that I like about it is that its performance for 4K gaming is incredible. So much so that I'm not using my gaming PC as much on my television as I used to because the 4K performance out of the Xbox is adequate, I think, for me. Now, I'm kind of a casual gamer, uh, so I'm not noticing huge differences between the Xbox and the PC, and it's a lot easier to work with the Xbox on my television, so it's been getting a lot of use. And related to that, Xbox Game Pass, which I think has made this list in the past, is coming back on the list this year because they have made some substantial improvements to it. Uh, the first, of course, is that the library is much richer now. They've acquired a lot of different studios, Bethesda being one of them. So now you've got all the Doom games on there. Uh, you also have Electronic Arts' catalog, or a good chunk of it, available there. And a lot of those titles are also on the PC if you have the Ultimate subscription. And the cloud gaming component was a really nice addition to the mix. So you can play the games on your low-powered laptops, for example. You can boot up your mobile phone and play with them on there. And now they're allowing you to actually stream the games to the console so you can check out some of the Game Pass titles quickly before you download them, which I thought was a really nice touch. We were just streaming a game uh, this morning upstairs in my family room. So altogether, uh, the Xbox Series X and Game Pass is a real winner this year. And related to Game Pass, there's a couple of game controllers that I would like to recommend this year. One is the Backbone controller if you have an iPhone. This is it here, and they uh, pair up very nicely with all of the different iPhones out there with a lightning connector. And I got to give these folks a lot of credit because when the iPhone 13 Pro came out, it didn't fit very well in the backbone, but they very quickly came up with a solution, a little slide-in rubber adapter here that solves the problem completely. And before that, they issued out a a 3D printable adapter to fix it quicker. So I was really pleased with how fast they addressed this customer concern and my backbone is working great once again with my iPhone 13 Pro. This is easily one of the best mobile controllers that I have ever looked at. Another controller that I was quite happy with this year was the new 8-Bit Do Pro 2. This was a new version of their SN30 Pro Plus that we looked at last year. But this one has some nice improvements along with keeping some of the existing features intact. Now you can attach your phone to the controller with a clip that they sell separately. The controller, even with a big phone attached, is very well balanced because of the handles on it. One thing to note though is that it's better suited for Android than iOS. It's not directly compatible with the iPhone, but there are some ways you can kind of shoehorn it in there. It does not work with the Xbox or PS5, but it does work with the PC, the Mac, and it works with the Nintendo Switch. They also have some great software you can download for configuring the dead zones on the sticks and the triggers and configure some of the buttons on it as well. It's a really nice solution and not all that expensive either. And this came in free of charge from 8BitDo in full disclosure a little bit earlier this year. So let's move on now to computers. And to be honest, I didn't see anything all that groundbreaking this year. That's not to say there weren't nice computers that were released. There's a bunch of them that we looked at from Dell, Lenovo, HP, and others. 
And the one that really stood out the most out of that list was this one from Lenovo. This is their Legion Slim 7 gaming laptop. And as we all know, gaming laptops are more than just for gaming. They're great for video production, photo editing, and all sorts of stuff. Great display, very thin and light, uh, really good performance. The fan noise wasn't all that offensive, and it was able to keep itself relatively cool. A real winner of a laptop, especially if you need power that is portable. And this would be on par with the new MacBook Pros with their M1 Max and Pro processors. But on the Windows side, you're going to find a lot more software to take advantage of the horsepower that these machines have. So if you're looking for a nice PC that's not too obnoxious, uh, this was one that really stood out to me this year. And in full disclosure, Lenovo let us borrow this laptop for the review, and they now have it back, unfortunately. It was a really nice computer. Uh, next, let's move on to PC accessories. And we saw a lot of neat Thunderbolt docking stations come out over the last year. Uh, this one from Kensington is the one that I am using the most with my new MacBook Pro. This is their SD5700T. And as you'll see on there, there are three Thunderbolt ports. So we're starting now to see these docking stations that work very similar to USB hubs in that you plug in one Thunderbolt cable, but get three additional Thunderbolt ports that you can use. And on the MacBook Air, where you only have two ports, this is really useful. And many PCs only have a single Thunderbolt port. This will work with any Mac with a Thunderbolt 3 port or any PC with a Thunderbolt 4 port. And let me show you how I have it set up over at my desk over there. All right, so here we are at my desk and I've got my MacBook here plugged into two 4K60 displays. These are LG displays. And you'll notice that there's only one cable going into the Mac. So this cable is delivering power to the computer, but also allowing us to send two DisplayPort outputs back out through the dock here. And what I like about this dock is that it delivers 90 watts of power, almost as much as the MacBook's power supply can deliver. And that's more than adequate to get the full power out of this thing. If I'm really running it at full blast, the battery might stop charging, but it can power every uh, drop of electricity that that processor inside needs. And what I like about this Thunderbolt hub beyond its power delivery is that you get some other ports. Um, so in addition to those three Thunderbolt ports, we've got a gigabit Ethernet, which I'm not using. I'll explain why in a minute, along with three USB ports here on the back. On the front, we've got a card reader and another USB port here along with an audio output. And this cable is what uh, goes over to the Mac. And you also have a discrete power switch here too if you want to shut the whole dock down. Now behind it here, I have a 10 gigabit Ethernet adapter that is also going into the dock. And as you can see here, I'm able to get my full three gigabit internet connection here running perfectly through just a single cable. Now, all of this bandwidth is being shared through the single port. So there could be instances where uh, things are really cooking on the displays and it might limit my upstream bandwidth a little bit. But for now, I really only need about three gigabits symmetrical for uh, making the most out of my internet connection. And this is working out just fine right now and all it takes is a single cable to get plugged in to have all of that stuff delivered. Now what I've got plugged into those Thunderbolt ports right now are two USB Type-C to DisplayPort outputs. Those are delivering 4K 60 video to both of these LG displays and then I also have a that 10 gig adapter here plugged into the third Thunderbolt port. So all those ports are used up now but I still have two more on the other side of the Mac for attaching hard drives and that sort of thing. Now for audio, I've got these Yamaha speakers that were sent to me through the Amazon Vine program free of charge a little while back. And rather than use the internal uh, audio on the dock, it doesn't have such a great uh, digital audio converter on it. I just run the speakers through one of the displays and that gives basically a direct pass through from the display port uh, out the monitor. So the audio quality is really nice. When I plug the Mac in, those speakers activate, the displays activate, and I'm good to go. A really nice docking solution with just a single cable. Now I do have some disclosures to make here. This device came in free of charge from Kensington, and I also produce videos for them that they often put on Amazon along with their products. But this one has really solved the problem for me, and I think it's one of the best docks out there at the moment. Now next up is the Lenovo TrackPoint 2 keyboard. I've got it right here. 
This has become one of the staple devices I use here on the channel for testing stuff. You can check out my full review. It's had almost 50,000 views over the last year. It's crazy. It connects up with your computer with Bluetooth or its USB dongle. There's a place for it right here. It is, of course, wireless and rechargeable, and it's got that familiar Lenovo keyboard and track point on board, and it's a really nice compact keyboard. My only gripe against it is that it doesn't have backlit keys, but beyond that, it has become something I use just about every day, and I really like this keyboard quite a bit. In full disclosure, Lenovo did send this to the channel free of charge last year for us to review. All right, let's move on now to networking, and without question, Starlink is the top networking product of the year. This, of course, is the SpaceX satellite internet product, and my brother, I uh, installed it up at his place in Vermont back in February. We did a video when it arrived to see how it all works and get kind of an initial performance assessment. I went back up there a few weeks ago and it's working even better. Uh, we also got it here in Connecticut for a short time. I just kind of kept the service for a month to see how it worked and it worked great down here as well. And if you are in an area where you can't get decent internet, Starlink is definitely worth signing up for because it is really uh, amazingly good for a satellite product. Very low latency, but very good bandwidth in both directions. I've got a playlist down in the video description where you can see all the videos we've shot regarding Starlink and how it works. Now, as many of you know, I'm a big fan of Mocha, which allows you to extend your home computer network through your cable TV wiring. It's not as good as Ethernet, but it is very close to being as good as Ethernet. And this year, there was a couple of new developments on the Mocha front, some very affordable boxes that allow you to transit up to two and a half gigabits. And these boxes from Translite kind of check all the boxes for me because you can use them uh, with your two and a half gigabit network, but you also get a second gigabit ethernet jack on board. It also has pass-through connectors so you can continue using your TV services if you still have them on your coax wiring. And these are very affordable also. Uh, check out my full review so you can see exactly how they work, but if you are looking for a way to extend your network without having to run ethernet cabling, uh, these boxes from Translite I think are real winners. And in full disclosure, Translite sent these boxes to the channel free of charge for a review. Next up is a free piece of software that will change your life. It is called SyncThing. And the best way to describe this is as a free roll your own Dropbox. Basically, you point the software at a folder and it will sync that folder up with other computers that you attach in one of your SyncThing chains. It is super easy to use very secure. It'll go through firewalls without having to set up port forwarding or anything. And I found this to be a very good alternative, not only to subscription services, but a lot of those utilities that come with your network attached storage devices as well. So if you've been looking for a way to synchronize files without having to pay any money to do so, SyncThing is definitely worth checking out. You can run it on NAS boxes. You can run it on Macs and PCs. There's a version for Android. I think there's some shoehorn thing on iOS as well. It's an open source project too, and it's really a fantastic way to keep files in sync. So definitely check it out. So let's move on now to TV boxes. And unfortunately, the TV box world has gotten less friendly for consumers over the past year. Our Android boxes are getting filled up with advertising now. Roku and YouTube are battling, and we may lose YouTube on Roku altogether. It's not been a good year for the TV streaming industry as far as consumers are concerned. But there is something that I found that does give consumers a little more power. Uh, this device that we looked at was a real surprise. It's called the Stream Locator, and it allows you to relocate yourself so that you can pick up sports games that you might otherwise be blacked out from watching. It also allows you to watch like you're coming from another country, but it's not a VPN. And because it's kind of like a router, all of your TV boxes work with it without having to do any special configuration beyond just pointing them at the stream locator. A really neat product. There is a subscription for it after the first year, but I think for some folks, especially those living overseas, it might be really useful. Check out my full review. They also have a free browser extension for Chrome where you can test it out and see if it's going to be a good solution for you. And in full disclosure, the Stream Locator folks sent this device to the channel free of charge for review. 
Next up is the tablet section, and if you don't like Apple, you might want to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, the iPad mini, I think, is a real winner of a tablet. I bought one to review, not thinking I would keep it, and it turns out I am keeping it, and I'm using it a lot. I really like the form factor. It is super slim and light and small, but the screen is large enough to be useful. I have my Apple Pencil that I bought for my iPad Pro attached to it. I take notes with it all the time. It's great to take to meetings with me. It's just an awesome little device, and it's really nicely powered as well. Uh, so this is something that surprised me, so much so that I'm now using it day to day, which I wasn't doing with an iPad for a while. So it kind of got me back into the iPad game. And while we're on the subject of Apple, I've got a few other Apple products that I was pleased with this year. Uh, the first one is the new third generation AirPods. I use AirPods every single day. I had a pair of first generations that I bought a couple of years back. These new ones are night and day better, both for battery life, but also for audio quality. They sound spectacular. A little on the bassier side for me, but they uh, really do sound great. And I can talk on the phone a lot longer with these than I could with my old ones. Even when my old ones were new, they didn't last all that long on a phone call. I really prefer earbuds to in-ear. So I was pleased to see that Apple was able to make a substantial improvement uh, to the earbud design here. So if you are looking for a set of AirPods, I would go and get these versus the second generation ones because they are that much better. Now next up are the Air Tags, and I was surprised by how good these things work, uh, both when you are in its proximity, but also if you happen to lose something out in the wild somewhere. Anytime an iPhone gets near it, anybody's iPhone, the Air Tag will report its location back to you. And there's some great videos on YouTube where people send these things all over the world and you can really granularly track where they go. It's pretty impressive. What I also like about them is that it will tell you when you leave something behind. So I was traveling to New York City a few weeks ago. I was at my destination and I just went out to grab a bite to eat, left my bag in the room. And because I wasn't at home, my phone was letting me know, hey, you're walking away from your backpack. Are you sure you want to do that? And it's nice to have that peace of mind and reminder to know that if I happen to leave my backpack behind, it's gonna tell me about it. And Apple is now building this into some of their other products and they're licensing it out. So for example, my AirPods have this technology built into each earbud. So if I drop an earbud somewhere and get too far away, it'll let me know where it is and the earbud will ping the phones to uh, let me know where uh, it was last seen. So this is a really neat technology that uh, really leverages the vast install base of iPhones very effectively. And finally, we have some production items that I found of interest over the past year. I was really impressed with the ATEM Mini Extreme. I have liked every single one of these ATEM Mini products that Blackmagic has been pumping out over the last couple of years because they are very affordable. The entry-level model that takes four HDMI inputs and has a lot of neat features built in is like 350 bucks. It's like less expensive than some capture cards are. Uh, this one is $1,000, but takes eight inputs, as you can see here. It's got a built-in encoder for recording and streaming, so you don't need a computer at all to use this thing for streaming. It also has something called Super Source that allows you to scale and composite, I think, four or five video streams simultaneously on screen. It's a really robust device for its price point. And if you're looking for something that is a video production studio in a box that doesn't require a PC, this is definitely worth taking a look at. And it's got a fairly open-ended API. The software that works with it is not the most intuitive. There is some things that you can do on the computer to configure it. Um, but there is some software out there like Central Control that unlocks, I think, a lot of the power of this device. So it's something that I think is a nice iteration of the prior ATEM Mini models into something that I think would work well uh, even in higher end production environments. And I know some people are actually using these with their other production hardware because they are so useful. So definitely check it out. One of the neat things about this is that in addition to recording video, you can also output video over USB. And when you plug it into a computer, the computer thinks it's a webcam. So you have this production thing that can plug directly into Zoom without any special software. Just a really cool device and definitely worth checking out. And I bought this uh, just so I have something I can take on the road with me from time to time. And I have done so with it and have been very happy. 
Uh, the next thing here is the Tula mic that we reviewed just uh, last week, as a matter of fact. And this is a microphone that's got a really neat retro design, but it's got a ton of neat ideas built into it. Uh, so the first thing is, is that it has two microphone pickup types. You can do cardioid or you can do omnidirectional. Additionally, you can plug in external microphones like a lavalier. It records onto its internal memory. So if you have it plugged into your computer for a podcast, you can have it record internally so you have a backup in case something happens to the computer. That's a neat feature. And then it also has noise reduction built in. And when you're using the noise reduction, it will save a file with the noise reduction enabled, but another raw file also in case you don't like the way it sounds. What's neat about this thing, and you can check out my review to get the full picture on it, is that they thought about a lot of the little things that annoy people when they're out recording audio. And this is a really nice solution, I think, for podcasters and video producers who are looking for something that has some fail safes built in. So check it out. It might be worth taking a look at. And in full disclosure, the folks from Tool of Mike sent this to the channel free of charge to review. So that'll do it for this year's top tech products. I was very surprised to find as many interesting tech products as we did, given how difficult it was for many manufacturers this year due to component shortages. But as you saw, a lot of neat stuff made it out the door and into my studio down here. Let me know if there's something that I missed or something I should be taking a look at down in the comments because I would love to get more stuff in here for review. So we'll have some more things to talk about next year. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you as usual by all of you. And I want to thank Chris Allegretta and Brian Parker for making gold level contributions during our recent live stream via Super Chat. We also had some other Super Chatters I want to thank, including Anthony Gwynn, James Tan Kia Howe, Eric's Variety Channel, Shin Chiki Chin, and Chanflay98. We also had super chats from an excellent chef, Arian Gomez and Grayson Petty. We also have some new supporters this week, including Frank Goldman, who made a gold level contribution via my donor box page. James also joined up as a member in addition to that super chat. And we also welcomed Rick Charles and Michael Matthews. And the folks in red there all joined via the YouTube membership program. If you want to join the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution via my donor box page. We also support the YouTube membership program via that join button. And we support Floatplane and Patreon. We have other places where you can find what I do, including my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop. Just about all of my videos go up on Amazon ad free. So if you want to see stuff that I do without the ads, head over there. We also do the live streams there at the same time that we do them to YouTube. Additionally, we have my podcast, which is at lon.tv slash anchor. And this is available on most of the major podcasting clients that are out there. And I'm now on Spotify, and this video appears on Spotify now too. And if you want to connect with the channel, you can do so through my very infrequent email list at lon.tv slash email. We also have my Facebook group and a Discord, which is a little bit more interactive, so you can chat with me and other viewers of the show in those two places. And then we have my store where I sell previously reviewed items that I purchased to review here on the channel, but there's only one of everything. So if you wanna get notified whenever we add something to that store, you can sign up at lon.tv slash store alert. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I greatly appreciate your support and your viewership. Let me know what you thought of this year's top products down in the comments below. Give me some suggestions for reviewing other things. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the lon.tv supporters, including gold level supporters, hot sauce and video games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis, and Handheld Obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv s.